Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here and for coming out on this lovely Friday evening. My name is David Jordan, and I'm one of the pastors here at First Baptist Decatur. We are so pleased to welcome all of you to this space. We are thankful to be able to be a part of these events where we actually discuss and learn about great books. Because we here at First Baptist believe books are important. We believe, we believe books should be read. We believe books should stimulate, challenge, and help us learn about ourselves and about one another and about the world and learn about truth. Because someone once said, the truth will set you free. So don't be afraid of the truth. And so we're so glad to be in this space. It is appropriate that we are here in a sanctuary. We like to think of this as a sacred safe space and we like to think of this as a brave space where we hear things that might trouble us, challenge us, make us uncomfortable, but help us understand that we need that to grow. So we're so glad you're here. We are thankful that we get to share this Friday evening together. We also are very thankful for the partnership that we have with Georgia Center for the Books and Joe Davich and also uh, Karis Books and ER. ER is gonna be coming in just a moment to introduce our special guests for this evening. If you need a restroom, there are two, one on either end uh, or uh, down the stairs in the back or to my right and to my left in the hallways. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome, we're glad you're here and we hope that you will be glad you're here too when this is over. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Some of y'all grew up in a church. <laughs> My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Karis Circle. Karis Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Karis Books, and Karis Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. Thank you. We are 49 years old, and we are so, so thankful for this partnership. We are thankful for this space. We are thankful for people who are grounded in sacred history, who also care about our future. Um, we know that it takes a lot to move through the world these days. And I woke up this morning uh, feeling a rare feeling of luckiness for what we are about to experience. Um, I want to just say thank you to all the people who make this space possible, the Georgia Center for the Book, but also all of the incredible volunteers, some of whom have been involved with this church since the 1960s. That means that they have evolved with Decatur, they have evolved with this church, they have evolved with the world. And how cool is it that um, they have witnessed all of the amazing authors and parishioners who have been in this space. So it's an honor to get to have this conversation in this space with all of you. I woke up feeling lucky, despite the horrors of the world, because Jasmine Ward is, to my mind, our greatest American author. Full stop. And so there's nobody that I want to sit in grief with um, more than Jasmine Ward, because her books have taught me so much about how to sit in ambivalence and grief and carry on. And the person that is going to be in conversation with her tonight, you may or may not know, y'all are Atlanta folks, some of y'all know Regina Bradley very well. Yes, put your hands together if you know Regina. If you don't know Regina, you're about to be in for a very big treat. But Regina is someone who also has taught me a lot about how to sit in ambivalence and grief, um, but also in joy and in resilience um, for what all of our many peoples can do. 
Um, so I'm gonna read their official bios, but I wanted to say that because um, in these days where we are trying to figure out how to be human together internationally in the world, art still really matters. Art is one of the only things that I believe actually can save us. Um, whether you are a spiritual person or a religious person or a diehard atheist, our words actually do change lives and they can save us. They can move us to action, they can move us to change, they can help us cross oceans and war zones. And this book in particular helps us move through time and recuperate parts of ourselves that are lost. For those of us who are white, this is a deeply important book. Um, and so I look forward to the response um, that you will have to this book. I got to read an early copy and I'm so grateful. So Regina N. Bradley is an award-winning writer and researcher of the Black American South. Dr. Bradley is an alumna Nasir Jones Hip Hop Fellow at Harvard University, Associate Professor of English and African Diaspora Studies at Kennesaw State University, and a faculty editor for Southern Cultures Journal. She is also the author of Chronicling Stankonia, The Rise of the Hip Hop South, Boondock Collage, Stories from the Hip Hop South, and editor of An Outcast Reader. The woman of the hour is Jesmyn Ward. Jesmyn Ward received her MFA from the University of Michigan and has received the MacArthur Genius Grant, a Stegner Fellowship, a John and Renee Grisham Writers Residency, the Strauss Living Prize, and the 2022 Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. She is the historic winner first woman and first black American of two National Book Awards for Fiction. For Sing, Unburied Sing, which came out in 2017, and Salvage the Bones, which came out in 2011. She's also the author of the novel, Where the Line Bleeds, and the memoir, Men We Reaped, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and won the Chicago Tribune Heartland Prize and the Media for a Just Society Award. She is currently a professor of creative writing at Tulane University and lives in Mississippi. So I want to invite you to just listen with your whole hearts. We're going to have an opportunity for questions. Um, there's a microphone here, and if you are um, not able or don't want to come to the mic, we'll bring a mic to you. Just raise your hand. Um, but let's just lean into this gift. Uh, please put your hands together for Regina Bradley and Jasmine Ward. What up, though? Hi! <laughs> How y'all doing? I know the traffic's not letting a lot of us be great. So thank you so much for being here. Um, as I guess previously stated, <laughs> Dr. Regina Bradley, this woman needs no introduction. Let's give some love to Ms. Jasmine Ward. I'm sorry. Oprah Winfrey's new best friend. Miss Jasmine Ward. How you? I'm all right. Yeah. 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 Old girl ain't Oprah's. <laughs> Old girl ain't Oprah's. Just saying. So, um, did you, I guess we just gonna jump into this conversation. <laughs> ER, keep me on time, cause you know, this is like talking to kinfolk right here. So I feel like we're on the poach. <laughs> um, but I, I, I mean, like, I'm, I'm thinking about this as an English professor, so bear with me, right? Um, first thing is, let us descend. Um, I always tell people when I, when I describe your writing, especially to students, I'm like, she always leaves me with brittle bones. Um, you take all the, all the marrow, all the blood, all, and you're just kind of sitting there, and I have to remember I'm in church, so I can't say. <laughs> what I usually say when I, finish <laughs> when I finish reading your book. But can you talk a little bit about 
just the naming practice of it, because naming is so important to black folks, especially Southern black folks. So when you were thinking about this journey and you're thinking about Anise, like, can you talk to us about the naming? Why Let Us Descend? Why did you name your main character Anise and all that good stuff? Mm, I, so I guess I could talk about the, like, it, I, I pronounce it Annis, but oh, okay. there's no right or wrong way. Look, whatever, listen, I just got a PhD it. in English. I don't know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so I was looking for names um, that were specific to Benin because I thought that's where, and I'm probably totally mispronouncing that, um, that's where I thought that they were, would, mm -hmm. were from, right? Her grandmother, um, and then you know that her mother and down the line her. Um, and so I just happened to find um, all A names that mm -hmm. worked um, for them that had, that I, where I liked the meanings of, of them, right? So I was like, and maybe that's another way that, you know, that her grandmother, you know, Mama Aza, and then her mom, that they could sort of retain some sense of their history and where they come mm -hmm. from. Like if they kept, you know, they they kept giving each other sort of A names, whatever A names they could remember. And so I thought, well, um, you know, maybe she, maybe her name in, you know, English, maybe that should be an A name too, right? And hopefully I can sort of get it, like it won't be, it won't sound exactly like, mm -hmm. you know, like, like Arise, like her, um, like that name, but maybe I can get it close mm -hmm. so that it, it could come across as like a, I don't know, like an inten intentional mispronunciation or bastardization into something that is acceptable to her sire, you know, and the people who. He need to go sit down. Somewhere. Right, right. Who and claim that they own. He always is talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that they own her. Um, the title, I struggle a lot with titles. Um, the only title that has ever come to me you know, from the beginning of a project, and it was what it was from the beginning, was my memoir, Men We Reaped. Mm. Um, once I found that, you know, the, the epigraph um, at the beginning of Men We Reaped, that's what it was. Um, but all my novels, I've always generate lists, like long lists of different titles, um, and, and then I try them out, you know, with the different drafts. I'll put this title that might work and you know on the draft and then two months later when I'm working on another draft I'm like this ain't the title and I'll take it off and then I'll put another one on you know because one one of my professors at Michigan um, Peter Ho Davies once he said you know you should always he said you should always have a title he said and that title can change mm -hmm. as your understanding of what your novel is about as that changes and so I always remember that and I took it to heart and so that's what I that's what I do, um, and it, so I, when I um, thought about that march, mm -hmm. you know, thought about that march like geographically, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you're going from the Upper South to the Lower South, where in the Upper South it's hilly and mountainous, mm -hmm. right? In the Carolinas, Virginia, you know, the Maryland, Tennessee, right? And then you descend, you're walking south and you're, you are basically approaching sea level and it's getting flatter and flatter. So it, it is a descent. And when I thought about that and what that march was like, I recalled Dante's Inferno and it had been 20 something years since I, had, since I read it. Um, so then I went back to it and I was just trying to see maybe um, if I could find a title somewhere mm -hmm. in it. And I didn't read the entire thing, but I reread bits of it, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and that part stayed with me. And so that's one of the like prospective titles that I put on my list mm -hmm. uh, that didn't stick until the very end, right? Um, when I sort of sent the, ver the sort of final revision to my editor and I was like, what do you think? What do you think of this title? And she said it, she said it worked. So when you, you if you're, if you're unfamiliar, right? So you have Dante mm -hmm. Alighieri, which is part of this three-part series, <laughs> English nerd. <laughs> um, so you have like Purgatory, 
Because I mean, like, I feel like there's a lot of purgatory in, in the story also, right? Um, so you have like heaven, purgatory, and then you have the actual inferno itself, right? And when I was reading this, um, it made me think about two things. The first thing I thought about was the final circle of hell, which is Judeca. That's the only thing I remember, don't, qu don't quiz me. <laughs> um, and it was like this dark kind of frozen over space, right? Um, and I'm like, yeah, that's the, I mean, like I, I, could, I could see enslaved folks in these slave quarters, especially in New Orleans, right? So like you have like the French Quarter and you, you know, you have like the actual stall, you could still see the stalls, right? Where folks were being, where folks were being held. But the other thing I was thinking about is that's a common theme in your work is you take this European mythological, you know, from salvage the bones to, you know, you would think, I thought about Medea and mythology, right? Um, and now we're with Dante. What is it about kind of remixing these common themes and centering black folks? Like what work are you trying to get it to do, right? Like I know that once it's out in the world, it does its own thing, but what, what work were you thinking about putting those two things together? I, um, you know, when I, I grew up in Mississippi, um, I did, did not do a lot of directed reading when I was growing up. Um, I, much more of my reading life consisted of me just reading everything that I can get my, my hands on. Mm -hmm. Um, and that ranged from, um, I don't know, from literary fiction, uh, you know, to fantasy, to sci-fi, to Greek mythology, to classics, right? And that continued on up, you know, like through my young adulthood um, and then into my years when I actually started studying creative writing. And so while I was in university, um, you know, I, when I was working on my undergrad degree, part of what I did, that wasn't actually, I didn't have a good, uh, I didn't have a good faculty advisor, right? Like, like the, my faculty advisor they assigned me, he was like a scientist or something, so he, he couldn't give me any help. Um, <laughs> so I ended up reading, um, I ended up studying a lot of African American literature, black Caribbean literature, um, black literature from the UK, some, um, you know, Af uh, literature from the African continent. Mm -hmm. Like I, I ended up getting like a, pr a pretty good education in the African, in, in like the literature of the African diaspora, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, but I guess, and, and of course that informed my work, right? Because as I'm reading, the literature of the African diaspora, I'm trying to figure out how we, how we tell our stories, how we um, retain a sense of our history, how we process, you know, what we are going through and what we have gone through, right? Um, but I, th and I, but I also think that, you know, that, that the, sort of the classical literature, the myths that I encountered in my youth are also a part of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I mean, I mean, they're also, I don't know, I feel like I can use them also as context to, under, to tell our stories and to understand what we've lived through and what we are living through in the, in the, in the present. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I feel like there's some resistance to that, uh, but I mean, I but it but it it just it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't. Did it, did that answer your question? Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I guess one of the things that I think about as, especially when it comes to your work as somebody who was born and raised in Southwest Georgia, um, how much we often have one foot in the past, one foot in the future, and we struggle with the present. And one of the things that I, I thought about a lot was, one, this idea of, on the one hand, people expect Southern black folks especially to be like, oh, slavery was so long ago, and it just happened so far, you know? And it's like, 
there's still a continuous effect, like these ripples, right? Like, you know, the South isn't linear, it's cyclical. Like something doesn't just happen one time and then we forget about it. We are continuously revisiting that. And one of the questions I have for you is, how do you see Let Us Descend in conversation with your other books that focus on the present, right? Um, because they're not as distinct as folks would automatically assume, like, oh, you know, she's writing about slavery, so here we go, right? Instead, I really thought about how Annis was in conversation with Esh mm -hmm. from Salvage the Bones, right? So I'm, I'm curious to hear, like, do you, do you see yourself looking at Southerness from this perspective that informs both periods of time and as you know, how do you see yourself in conversation with folks like Harriet Jacobs, for example, like incidents in the life of a slave girl? How do you see yourself in conversation with these enslaved women who wrote about the terrors of slavery during that time um, from, a, from the unique perspective of thinking about it from the present? You know, I, the, so I am, and it's one of those questions I think that I'm thinking about more and more in my work and trying to like answer in my work. Like, I'm always thinking about time. I'm always thinking about the way that the past lives in the present, mm -hmm. right? Um, some of that came up in seeing Unburied Sing, right? right? When, um, you know, when, when Richie is telling Jojo, like, you don't know nothing about time, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's all happening at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. And hitting uh, Richie, the ghost, like, his experience of the afterlife was exactly that, right? Like, everything was happening all at the, at the, same, um, at the same time. And, and he was able to see how the actual history of what had occurred lived in the landscape and, and sort of bore down on, on, on the present. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Like, I think that Esh and that Annis are sort of twinned, even just in their experiences, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them lo lose their mothers, right? Both of them are grappling with grief mm -hmm. um, and attempting to navigate the world without, without that, that presence of their mothers, without right. the presence of their caregiver to help them navigate it, right? And both of them are figuring out that it's a brutal place to be. Um, I, uh, I, I did read some, um, you know, some slave narratives, and I wish that I could remember the titles of the books now. Um, one of them that I remember that I read, um, was it was just all women, right? Mm -hmm. All women's accounts, um, and that is uh, where I got one of the epigraphs from, mm -hmm. right? Was one of those accounts um, in that in that book of of slave narratives, and I think I don't know I I. I when I was reading them, I was sort of dissatisfied, not with the quality of the story or of, or of what was being expressed, but, but I just wanted more, mm -hmm. you know? Like I was like, why aren't there more? Why aren't there more um, accounts of what it was like, you know, for women of African descent to, to, to go through this, to, sur mm -hmm. to survive this? Um, uh, and, and I think that it was like particularly frustrating because many of the the narratives that I encountered seemed uh, seemed sanitized, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I heard, I read that there are different reasons that that is the case, right? Um, and, and I just wanted more, like I wanted, mm, I wanted to feel it, you know, mm -hmm. I wanted, I wanted it to feel present. Um, and so I think that's part of what I was trying to do in, in Let Us Descend, right? Like I really wanted to pull the reader in, into An Annis's world, you know, pull, like immerse the reader in her perspective, mm -hmm. in her perspective, and like really um, crowd the reader into mm -hmm. Annis's experience. 
No, I like that because that was going to lead to my next question, which is, <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, like, one of, one of the other things that really continuously comes up in your work is the question of difficult black women, right? And difficult in the sense of society doesn't know what to do with them, difficult in the sense of they have their own personal trauma going on, difficult in the sense of they want to give up but, but, but can't. Um, and even in your memoir, you talk about like the difficulties of being a black woman, right? Um, and I'm wondering, you know, to kind of push that question a little bit further is like, there are plenty of difficult women in this book, right? Um, and difficult not because they're just like, I'm gonna just be resistant, but difficult in the sense of what you were talking about earlier, which is how do I see myself in a world where I'm not supposed to even exist? I'm not supposed to have a voice. I'm not supposed to have anything but be, you know, chattel. So one of, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, you know, how does slavery impact that idea of difficult women that you have, you know, you've explored in your previous books mm -hmm. and what makes this different? You know, I, one of the reasons I struggle with, with it, with write, in writing this book, first of all, I knew nothing about American chattel slavery. Um, I read for like two and a half years before I even started writing because I because I really I didn't know anything, and I read about everything from, you know, just like general, uh, I guess, analysis and like uh, history of American mm -hmm. chattel slavery. I I read books about that were specifically about slave markets, slave pens, the New Orleans slave mm -hmm. markets. I read books about maroon communities um, in the United States. Um, you know, I just, I read books about, that were just about like sugar, sugar cane plantations. Um, and, and so I did that for two and a half years and then I was like, okay, you'll never know everything. You just have to start writing, mm -hmm. right? And if you, uh, you know, if there are things that you don't know moving forward, well, then you just have to research more. Um, and so then, so I started writing, but I kept writing the same beginning over and over and over again mm -hmm. because I think I was stuck on that, right? Like on this idea that the, that, that Annis, you know, this, this girl, this young adult that I'm writing about, she has little to no physical agency. Mm -hmm. And I just like couldn't figure out how to write about, how to write from a character's perspective, like who has little to no physical agency? Because, you know, I've been in a lot of creative writing classrooms, right? And we're always taught in those workshops, right? That plot isn't about what happens to a character, but that plot should come from character, mm -hmm. right? So, so the character should make things happen that that that's like the most important aspect of plot but then how does someone who has little to no physical agency make things happen yeah. in the world so i so i was struggling with that and so i kept writing the first three chapters over and over and over and over again and um then once i was when 2020 came and then i was struggling with my grief mm -hmm. Uh, I stopped working on the book um, and then uh, sort of had a revelation, right, because I, which I've spoken about, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but had this moment where I was like, okay, I haven't written for six months, is this it? Like, have I written the last book that I'm ever going to write? Um, and then I thought, well, the last thing that, um, you know, because my partner's name was Brandon, mm -hmm. I was like, the last thing that Brandon would want is for you to stop, mm -hmm. to stop writing. The last thing that he would want is for his loss to make you stop, right? right? Because I had gotten to, I was just in a very hopeless place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and so I went back into the book and then, but for me, like what I was going through with my grief helped me to understand what Annis was going through Mm -hmm. Right, and it also helped me to understand that even though she didn't have a, she didn't have much physical agency, she had all these other types of agency. Right, right, and 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 it's the same types of agency I think that 
all the other women characters, you know, in my other books that they exercise too, right? Like agency of memory, agency of imagination, emotional agency, spiritual agency, right? Yeah. Like they have all these other ways that they can exercise their own personhood mm -hmm. and power in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so that, so, you know, it, it's, I don't know, it's, it's strange, but that's how I find, found my way to that understanding. I'm just kind of my feelings about the writing thing because I'm dealing with something similar, right? It's like, how do you continue to write after something so traumatic happens to you that what gives you influence and gives you inspiration is, is suddenly taken from you, right? right? Um, but, you know, that was one of the other questions I had too was, this is multiple levels of grief in this book. And it's not just grief like, I'm sad. Mm -hmm. There's the literal grief of, how do I move on? Right. There's the literal grief of, how do I literally get up in the morning, right? right? Um, and then as you said earlier, you know, that's amplified by a character that doesn't have agency over themselves. There's no lack, there's no self autonomy, which in itself is also a form of, of grief. And I would love to hear, you know, two things. One, was there an aspect of enslavement that you were like, I can't because of the grief? Because there's so much loss when you think about these narratives, right? It's like, I lost this person, probably one of the most grief, you know, grievous things I've ever read were the letters that were in newspapers after the Civil War that was like, I'm looking for so-and-so. This person was at this plantation between these years. If you're still alive, if you're still out there, right? Um, absolutely heartbreaking, right? Um, and this isn't a diss, this is, this is, you know, the way that you address grief across your bibliography, because you have a bibliography now, right? I mean, I, I, was, I, I was curious about like, where do you feel your own grief most showed through in the prose for Let Us Descend? And where was it that you were like, nope, nope, I can't do it. Because if I do it, it'll overshadow what ultimately what I'm trying to do with this character in this story. I don't know if I could answer the second part of the question because I, because I, I don't recall thinking that, like feeling that kind of trepidation mm -hmm. um, in the book. Um, I think my, you know, I, I didn't realize how much this character reflects my own uh, journey with grief, mm -hmm. I guess, um, and my own understanding of grief. I didn't realize that until my editor, Kathy Belden, was like, even though you know this takes place in the early 1830s, mm -hmm. I feel like, or in the early 1800s, I feel like this book reflects more of you than any you know, besides Men We Read, right. right? Than any of your of your novels. Mm. And she said it and then I was like, she's right, you know, because there were so many, there was, I mean, so many aspects of Annis's grief that I think were informed by by what I was going through. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are times in the book where she just wants to tell her mom something. You yeah. know, she sees something in the world, she experiences something in the world, and the first person that she thinks about sharing this with is her mom, but she can't do that because her mom isn't there anymore. Um, she, even though she, know, she knows that her mom is gone, there are moments where, where she thinks there's the possibility that her mother is just right behind that tree or just at the corner of her eye. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And, and she and she believes it, and that's the same thing with, you know, it's the same thing with, you know, with my grief, right? There are time I remember all the time, like like I remember even like when my brother died, right? Mm -hmm. There were all so many times that I thought I was would be in my mom's house, and I'd be like, he's gonna come walking out of his room yep. in any moment. You know what yep. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, and so, you know, when Annis goes through that, like, that's part of, I guess, of where I was pulling that from, right? Um, there's that moment where, you know, so one of the things that I admire so much about Annis and that I think um, this part of, of her journey helped me through my own grief, right, was like, I had this, I, I begin to understand that like part of the way that Annis resists what she is going through, you know, the, the system of slavery, right, is she constantly makes connections with people. You know what I'm saying? She, she makes friends, she finds family, she finds lovers, you know what I'm saying? She finds sisters, like she's constantly making connections, right? And that's her way of, that's one of the ways that she's resisting what is happening um, to her. So there's this moment in the book where she, ha she, takes a, she has a lover, right? right? And in that moment, she, it's like she's in two moments at once mm -hmm. because she's remembering the lover that she lost right. while she's in this moment with this present lover, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And, and that seems very true to grief to me too, you know, because just because, and everybody knows this, everybody who ha is living with grief, and that's so many of us, right. you know, um, but, you know, just because, just because you lose someone, that does not mean that you stop loving them, right. you know, that doesn't mean that you don't carry them with you, that doesn't mean, you know, that sometimes you feel like you're in, in, in a past moment with them. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, speaking of history, of the past, living in the mm -hmm. present, right? So, so yeah, I think what I was going through with my grief, I think that informed so much about how I understood that she might make her way through this world. No, I'm, I'm tearing because it's like just the cold conversation about, so, just real quick, my, my grandmother was murdered two years ago in my face, <laughs> in my house. Um, and uh, Jasmine and I have talked about this at length, right? It's, it's not like we're like in a grief Olympics, like who's grieving worse? <laughs> but just the, I, just the way you described it is something that I deal with on a daily basis, which is like, oh, this happened. Like when I found out I was in conversation with you, the first person I wanted to tell was my grandmother and I couldn't. I was like, oh, oh that's right, right? So it's like there's... It, it amplifies in such a way that um, if you are grieving, it cracks your chest wide open, right? right? And it's not because you're grieving, it's not necessarily because there's something in the story that's like, that's exactly how I'm grieving. It's just that you feel that same emotional attachment right. that's like the denial, mm -hmm. right? The um, negotiation. I felt like, you know, folks talk about the steps of, of grieving, right? And they're all, all of them are in this book. Right. But the one that I felt was most amplified was negotiation. Mm -hmm. If I do this, can I do, can I do this, right? right? Um, but one of the other things I wanted to ask you is um, probably one of the most seen, unseen characters in all of your fiction, and even in your memoir, mm -hmm. is the geography, mm -hmm. the land. Mm -hmm. You give so much gorgeous attention. It's almost like you step your game up each book. It's like you have where the line bleeds and you're talking about like the river where Josh and Kristoff, you know, they jump off the bridge and become men, right? And then you talk about Katrina in a particular way and salvage the bones. And then you talk about like, this is what we were looking at. Probably, you know, one of the things that I teach in my African-American lit class is um, the chapter on Josh. And you pay so much attention to like, I wasn't there, but I think that the land was looking like this as he was rolling through and he was listening to rap and he was feeling the bass. And, and then in this particular novel, like you were pointing out earlier in the conversation, it's like you have these levels of southernness that are associated with particular landscapes. Um, why do you feel like the landscape is so important to make sure that readers appreciate and also don't let it just slide into the background of why you're writing the way that you do. I 
feel like I'm repeating myself. I don't know if I can give you a good answer to that question. I mean, <laughs> I think about place all the time. Right. You know, in part because people always, you know, from the very beginning, from where the line bleeds, like people have always asked me about place. And so at one time I was like, well, I need to figure out how I'm gonna answer that question. Uh, and so I started thinking about, about like, you know, place um, in, trying to come up with my own understanding of how mm -hmm. place functioned in my work. And so in my head, I just, I tied a lot of it to, to character, mm -hmm. right? And, and, um, and so when I would talk about it, I would say, well, you know, like pl place determines so much about character because it determines um, the, it, it determines what a character has experienced mm -hmm. of the world, how a character sees the world, how a character understands the world, how a character will make connections between one thing and another in, in the world. I mean, I feel like all of that is like, is very specific, like place spe mm -hmm. specific. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that, that I'm aware of those connections in all my work, um, but I'm also aware of the weight of history in, in this place, um, mm -hmm. in the South, right, and, and of how like the repercussions of that history live in the South, but so often, at least if I'm, you know, just like speaking for myself, I lived with the repercussions of that history, but, but did not know it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like I didn't, like I, you know, generations of my family have been poor, right? Mm -hmm. Have lived in poverty. Um, but I never understood why, right? Until I was an adult and I started reading and I began to piece things together, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. understand a little bit more about systemic racism, right? right. And slavery and Jim Crow and just like the, the history um, of this country. Right, and then and then things begin to make make sense. Right, um, and so I don't. So I think that I'm trying to depict that mm -hmm. um, in in my work, and then also, uh, you know, when I was little, I was a bookworm, right, like a lot of us probably, and um, I, you know, I was just reading everything that I could get my hands on. I was. I loved my little elementary school library, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would just read Don't let everything. Don't it be the school book fair. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, that was like Christmas. I'm telling you. Right. Um, but I would, at recess, instead of playing like kickball or something like that, and I was awkward anyway, so I wasn't good at it. You know, it wasn't fun to me. It felt like torture. Um, <laughs> I would sit on the side of the playground and I would read, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I wasn't reading, I was like, I was looking up at the trees, right? And I was watching the way that the trees sort of waved in the wind, right? Mm -hmm. And I was watching the movement, tracking the movements of, of the clouds across the sky and, try, and trying to find some kind of language to describe the way that the shadows from the clouds moved across the playground, mm -hmm. right? In one moment, you know, you were in blazing sunlight and the next moment you were in this, I don't know, so this, this cool darkness, dark right, sky. right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so I feel like, I don't know, like maybe those were my, the, some of the first steps that I took towards expressing myself using language, right? Mm -hmm. Like the landscape and the way that I was like aware of the landscape was pushing me towards that because, mm -hmm. I, because I felt a kind of awe. And even as a kid, it, it was beautiful to me. Right. And there was something about it that moved me. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think all of that maybe is tied into the way I write about place. I love that. So I have one more question for we can open it up for the audience. Um, I am a huge advocate of thinking about genealogy. Um, something I have to explain to students, my daughter, <sighs> is that things don't just happen in a vacuum. You're not the first person, right? 
even though, anyway, it's a whole different conversation. <laughs> but I, you know, one of the questions I asked um, Thierry Jones for Atlanta Magazine was how does she, like, how does she see herself in conversation with Southern black women writers? Because Southern black women writers are so underappreciated canonically. They're so underappreciated in conversations about, you know, um, this is what it means to be Southern. This is what it means to be American. This is what it means to be black, right? And one of the things I really appreciate about Oprah is that three of her last picks, one, Tayari and, you know, Honoree Jeffers, have been book club selections. So that is offering the opportunity to have further insight into this kind of like insulated world that we as Southern black women have to navigate. So my question is, you know, who, who do you see yourself in genealogy with? Like, who do you, who do you see yourself in conversation with um, when thinking about the South, when thinking about black folks, when thinking about Americanness even? Um, I'm just really curious, I never asked you that, so. I mean, I, all the people that, you know, that you named, Honore and Tayari and Natasha Trethaway and, um, you know, of course, going back, you know, to Zora Neale Hurston. And, I was gonna um, talk about you if you didn't mention Zora. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and there are others who, of course, I'm like blanking right now. I didn't drink any coffee before I came here. Well, I'm here. sorry. I should. I, um, it was my fault. Um, but Anne Moody, right? She wrote. She wrote yep. the autobiography, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Growing up, Grow up Mississippi, in Mississippi, Mississippi right? Yep. Um, so there, there, there are so many, and and I, I don't know, like, you know. There's you, like you didn't talk about yourself. You know what I'm saying? You, yes, 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 yes. I mean, I, you know, I just, I think that I, um, I just feel really lucky. You know what I'm saying? Because, because to be working at the same time, right? Um, in this sort of cohort, right. right? Of Southern black women writers, because I've, it felt very lonely, I think, when I was trying to break into publishing mm. in, you know, around 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. Like, I didn't know anybody, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't, and, and I think at that time, there was a particular resistance mm. to publishing us, you know, and, and sometimes that was the, like, sometimes, uh, you know, I think that was always like the subtext of the conversations that I was, that my agent was having with various publishing uh, houses, mm -hmm. right? And then sometimes it came out, right? When people, when, um, you know, say the paperback division said, this won't sell in paperback, so that's why we can't mm -hmm. buy it. In other words, there's no audience for this. Nobody right. wants to read this. You know, this is not, th there's nothing universal about this. It's so, so lazy though, right? Right. Man, it's such a lazy response. Right. Nobody wants to read this. Meanwhile, right. sure would like to see myself in a book. <laughs> <laughs> sure would like to see myself as something other than. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I, so, so yeah, so I'm, I, I am very, I'm super grateful right now to work, you know, to work with y'all and then, you know, and that's not even mentioning, right? Like Kiese and Brian Washington. The and, goat. You know what I'm saying? There are so, there's, I, I just, I feel very lucky, very lucky. I, I've been saying on social media that we're in the middle of a Southern black renaissance. And I love it because there's a particular sensibility, I think, mm -hmm. that even if we don't know each other, right? We're having a conversation, right? <laughs> like, did you, did you think about right? Because I mean, like, the South isn't monolithic, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, the way that I grew up in Georgia is different than the way that you know you grew up in Mississippi than somebody in Alabama. But we have these threads that are almost like spider webs sometimes mm -hmm. that pull us and connect us together, right? Right. Um, and I just, you know, the last thing I want to say before we open it up for questions um, is, you know, I just want you to get your flowers, all of them. Right, I and mean, like you know, particular periodicals that. <sighs> anyway, right. I was available. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I was available, um, but um, thank you. 
Thank you for, for writing about the difficulties of being Southern. Thank you for not being afraid to be your authentic self on the page, which for those of us who are still trying to find that voice, um, we look up to you and we love you. Um, and if you never hear that on the rest of this tour, uh, you are living proof that the South got something to say. <laughs> You're living proof that the South still got something to say. Um, and we out you and we working. Right. So thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. So Jasmine Ward, everybody. So please feel free to ask a question if you would like and are maybe a little intimidated by the microphone stand, wave your hand and I'll bring the microphone around to you, but don't make me chase you from one side to the other. <laughs> okay. See, y'all are starting with chasing me one side to the other. Hold on. Thank you. Um, so both of y'all are just so, um, such a huge influence on me as a writer. And um, just like you all were saying, there were no models at the time when we began and, you know, being compared to like Faulkner, you know what I mean? It's like, well, I have more in common with Andre 3000, <laughs> you know what I mean? So your epigraph from uh, Salvage the Bones, you know, I just want you to know that I feel such a kinship with you, speaking of giving you your flowers, and just beyond and before all the, you know, the praise and the accolades, it means so much that you see us so clearly and that you can speak to that experience that allows us to know ourselves better and to continue to write the way forward. And you too, Regina, just, Thank you so much for just really just being so steeped in the Southern culture and so proud of that because that's the thing about being Southern is that um, that old stereotype that we are not as smart, we are slower. Um, and we know that's not the case. There's so much rich, richness um, in our lineage. Um, there's so much wisdom but also just other types of ingenuity. And I think that that doesn't often get depicted across the literary landscape. And you're doing it, and Kiese's doing it, and Honoré, and Tiara, all of you all are doing it. So I just want to say thank you. That's it. Thank you. Um, hi, I just wanted to say I'm so glad that I caught this event. I am a huge fan of your work, Jasmine, so um, I'm glad to be here and participating in this. My question is around something that you said in talking about agency, um, and you mentioned emotional agency, and it made me wonder if in your research about slavery, if you came across anything that talked about enslaved women, enslaved mothers in particular, having to temper their love and affection for their children because, you know, they could be snatched from them at any time or vice versa. Um, I didn't come across that in my research, but it is something that I thought about um, and that actually came out in the novel because Annis makes that um, observation about the woman, um, the mother that, that, that she sort of shares a, um, a cabin with, that Annis and her mom share a cabin with a woman who has children and Annis observes and says, like, she won't something like she won't love what she can't keep, right? Like she tries not to love what she can't keep and that's one of the reasons that she's so, that the other mother is so hard um, on her children. It's almost like she's trying to keep like 
I don't know, like her, like emotional walls up, like keep some distance, right? But I mean, that's futile, right? Um, but yeah, I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I didn't encounter it in my research, but I don't know, it, um, when I found myself in that moment with Annis, he's like, when I'm writing, it, it often feels like the character's right here talking to me. And so she said that, you know, like she was the one who was like, she won't, she won't love what she can't keep. Thank you. Thank you. Real quick, can I shout out somebody? Professor Black. <laughs> Don't be up in here acting like you just, you just out here. Um, get these flowers, thank you so much. Just wanna make sure I put that, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Back to the Q&A, thank you so much. May, may I ask a question of each of you? Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna throw them out at you at the same time. Uh, Regina, have, have you ever had a conversation with Kiese about Outcast? And if so, what is it like? <laughs> and Jasmine, uh, word-wise or narratively speaking, where do you see you? Ex where do you want to explore next? What do you want to explore? I should ask that question. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> what's what's hilarious is that um, I, I call Kiesa and, and Jasmine Big Cuz. So every time I talk to them, I'm like, "What's happening, Big Cuz?" And they're like, "What's going on, little Cuz?" <laughs> um, I talked to Kiesa about Outcast 51 million times. Um, we often debate about what's the favorite. It depends on what day of the week it is. Today's Friday, so today's favorite is a Um Tomorrow might be ATL I don't know. But um, I think one of the things I, I most connect with, with Kiese about is our love of Southern hip hop and the way that it shows up in our writing. I think one of the things that we do a disservice about when it comes to conversations about the South and hip hop is that we often just think it's lyrics. It's also influence. Um, it's a coping mechanism for so many of us, right? And even, you know, even Jasmine talks about it in, in Men We Reaped especially, it's like the way that we grieve is influenced by what we're listening to. It's influenced by how do we express these things that are not so savory or not so respectable. Um, so yeah, I talk to Kiese about it all the time. Um, I'm, you know, once he wrote his, uh, his art of storytelling essay though for Oxford American, I just wanted to quit writing Chronicling Stankonia because I'm like, Psh -sh -sh. where can I go after this? Like, you bring your grandmama in it, you do all these things, right? So, so you know, it's, it's just really, again, I feel like we are in the midst of this Southern black renaissance where we are unequivocally, unabashedly, and unapologetically Southern and black and country. <laughs> um, and I feel like, you know, you and Kiese are at the, at the forefront of that. You, you know, y'all kick the door open so that we can run. And I'm really excited to see who's coming out behind us. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for that question. So I'm, I'm under contract for um, actually a middle grade slash YA book. So that's what I'm writing next. I haven't written a word. Um, <laughs> Not one word. Uh, every time I run into Jason Reynolds, which has only been like twice, um, it, because I'm, he, I, I'm, I will, I'm going to work with his editor, like, and my editor, both of them. I have two editors um, for that book, but I always tell him I haven't written a word, and he's like, I know, you know, like my editor told me. Um, <laughs> uh, but I'm hoping to to begin. Uh, in January, you know, because I, I, I'll be d done with the book tour and I can sit down and I can really dive into it. I've always wanted to write like a middle grade, um, specifically middle grade, I feel like, book because I want to write the book that I was searching for as a kid. Does your daughter like to read? Because that's going to be your critic right there. <laughs> she, I feel like she goes in and out of liking to read, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes she'll find books and she'll be like, oh, this is the best book ever, and she'll want to read the whole series, mm -hmm. right? And then, you know, a month later, you know, she's like, I hate reading, right? <laughs> um, and I, I think some of it is tied to 
you know, what our teachers are doing in the classroom and having to take quizzes every week on the books and not getting, a, I think, a lot of opportunity to read for pleasure. Mm -hmm. Where when mm -hmm. I was growing up, that's all, right, that's all I did. we did. Right, right. So. Well, if you want to share, she's going to be like, Mom, listen, I have notes. Right. So. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Hello, ladies. How are you? Um, Jasmine, you know I'm a big fan of you. How you doing? How you doing? And Regina, my girl, what's up? What's up? Um, one of the things that I was thinking as I was reading Let Us Descend uh, was particularly about this spirit that comes, right? Aza, right? And it made me think about just um, the legacy of women and grandmothers particularly. And I wanted to know what your relationship is or was with your own grandmother. Um, I've been thinking a lot about my grandmother um, in the past, you know, two years or so, because my grandmother, um, one, she's the first storyteller of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, like I grew up listening to my, you know, I have this huge extended family on my mom, my, grand, my maternal grandmother's side, one of my cousins is right there in the front row. Um, and we would get together all the time, you know, just as a big extended family. And one of the things that I always remember um, about my grandmother um, was that she was always telling stories, right? Um, and, and we were listening. You know, um, and I think a lot, and some of, some of the stories were funny and some of them weren't so funny. Like some of them were serious and I, and I didn't realize how serious until I grew, you know, got older and was able to like think about the stories that she told us um, and then think about why, you know what I'm saying? She might have been telling us some of those, you know, more traumatic, um, stories, um, but you know, it's one of the re another reason that I have been thinking about my grandma, my grandmother a lot is because she is losing her memory, right? So that so so that is making me think a lot about legacy, yeah. right? Um, and about and about sort of storytelling as you know how we use storytelling for survival, how we use it for celebration, how we use it to show each other that we love each other, you know what I'm saying? How we use it to forge connect connections, you know, to strengthen the connections that, um, that we share. Um, you know, I, don't, I know I don't, I don't write about my grandmother, like say as much as like Kiese does, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, he writes about his grandmother a lot. Um, right, right. Uh, but, but yeah, that's what my, my maternal grandmother, I mean, you know, for years when I was growing up, we lived in her, in her house. There was like 14, 15 of us living in her house. And she was always like that too. She would take in, you know, various people in, in the family and they would live there when they needed to. Like, I don't know. She was, she was such a, it's sort of heartbreaking for me now, you know what I'm saying? Because she was such a center, you know, for me and, and my family. And, um, and it's just, it's, um, yeah, it's very sad to me that, you know, because of age, right, that that is not the case now. Regina, Jasmine, we have one over here on this side. Um, you talked a lot about the grief you were going through while writing this book. So I was wondering if you, it was, it was like hard to release it or if it was healing in some way. You know what? I don't think that we talk about grief enough because I think like the, the language that I encountered around grief, um, say after my brother died, you know, I had somebody say, they didn't say you gotta let it go. They, they just said, they said something like, like you gotta move past it, right? Just like that, that, that I kept encountering that kind of language, right? Uh, that seemed to infer that grief was, some, was 
was an emotion that you could just, right, that you could get rid of and that it was some, it, that it's like an impediment and it's something that you just, you move past, right? And that is not how grief works. Grief never ends, you wanna know why? You know why? Because you, ne you never stop loving the person that you lost. You love that person that you lost, you love them for the rest of your whole life. Right, and, so, and, and more, right? And so, uh, you know, grief, I've heard this too, and I think this is truer, that grief is like, it's like the ocean. You know, some days are calmer, some days are, you know, more tempestuous, you know, some days are unbearable and you think you're going to drown. Um, so, so, you know, I think that I needed to write Let Us Descend, that that helped me, I don't know, I, cause like I said, at one point I was hopeless, you know, I have a therapist, I work a lot of this out with my therapist and that's one of the things I told her at one point, right after my partner died, I was like, I'm just hopeless, right? Um, and I think in writing Annis' story, that one of the things that I learned um, was that, and I knew, and I feel like I, I sort of knew this, you know, because, because of, because my brother died when he was 19, I was like 22, 23, right? So I, I sort of knew this, but I don't know, writing this book, it's like I learned it all over again. Sometimes you do that. Sometimes you learn, you have to learn things over and over in your life. And so one of the things that I learned was that, was that part of what makes grief so hard is that you, you have to, you know, you're mourning the person you lost. You're mourning the, the life that you lost with that person too. And the person that you were. Right, and the person that you were, and you're working to find your way towards a different version of you and your life without this person that you love. And that's a hard, that's hard. That's, a, that's something that is very difficult to do. Um, Annis does that in this book, right? Um, it is very easy, you know, this is something that she confronts too. It's so easy. I mean, how easy, I just feel like it would have been very easy for Annis to be like, I'm done. I, I don't wanna do this no more, I'm done. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and I have felt that before, you know? And I think all of us who have experienced great loss have felt that before. Right, but Annis makes that choice every day to keep going, right? To keep breathing, to keep moving, right? Um, and so I feel like, like that's the that's one of the lessons that she taught me in this book about about grief. You know that there's a choice, and every day you make that choice as you're fighting your way towards this different version of your life. Regina, Jasmine, if we could, let's take these last four to end up the evening. Um, so thank you all so much for your time. Just real quick, so it's a Friday evening. I was tired. I was, you know, parenting, working all week. I did not want to come, right? I was like, I'm gonna sleep in. Jasmine signed something for me when I was in Mississippi, so I'm good. You know, I could hit Regina up on Facebook, but um, I'm so thankful that I came, right? Because it was so generative. I have a talk on humor as a coping mechanism in African-American culture in the morning that I have not written and conversations with Kiese Laban that's under contract that I also have not written. Hopefully my editor is not what? in here. Uh, <laughs> so so, so that, that will be due soon. So, um, but it felt like kismet, right, being here um, because whenever I give a talk, I always invoke my grandmother and she's the ancestor that I most closely identify with. So when Professor Black said that, I was like, oh my God, you know, and so everything felt timely. Um, so before the quick question, just speaking of giving people flowers, Regina is so dope, she has not given herself props because 
while I love OutKast, um, the Hot Boys was the first concert I ever <laughs> attended, right? And so when I wanted to do a reader inspired by her, you know, I was like, I'm going to put it on Facebook. She immediately shared, was like, this is dope, submit your essay. So I'm so thankful because she's helping bring, bring about this new Southern Renaissance, right? So give her her props. <laughs> So the question I wanted to ask real quick was about, because um, you mentioned Ann Moody's coming of age in Mississippi, right? And her mother was a domestic, and I'm thinking about um, even Annis, right? Um, not to do any spoilers. But I was wondering, because rites of passage is something that I write a lot about, and so I was thinking about um, if there's a specific Southern black woman or even a Mississippi rite of passage that you, that you think is running through your work or other works. I was thinking about invisibility with domestics because my grandmother was a domestic, but I don't know. Like, do you have thoughts about that? Have you ever uh, found roll the through line? Roll of thunder, line? hear my cry. No, roll of thunder, hear my cry, for real. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, like that rise of immediately comes to mind. She has that whole series, but she didn't ask me, she asked you, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's a hard question to answer too. Uh, I, you know, like I begged Regina backstage. I was like, "Come on, Jean, take it easy on me, please." Uh, and now I feel like, you know, it's a, it's, 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 it's I'm being tested, and I, I don't know if I'm passing. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I, the idea of 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 that kind of domestic service that makes sense to me. Um, because my grandmother worked in that line of work. My mom did too, you know what I'm saying? And, and I think one of the first time, one of the first moments where I was like, um, I think aware of just like, I don't know, aware of the weight of the past, aware of the, the, um, the way that the past lives in the present, aware of, um, I don't know, like r racial difference and how it uh, plays itself out um, and inequality plays itself out in personal spaces was my mom taking me to work with her and um, I was sitting on the couch with the woman who was a white woman, a uh, wealthy white woman who she worked for. And the wealthy white woman was uh, at, like asking me questions and like engaging me in conversation because I went to her kid's school on, on scholarship. Um, and it was like my mom was like invisible. You know what I'm saying? Like my mom was in the, you know, it was like an open sort of kitchen uh, sitting room area and my mom is you know is at the sink you know in the kitchen washing and cleaning and serving mm -hmm. and in the way that the woman was interacting with me you know some of my mom was like a non-entity um, and so I don't know like I think maybe that was one of the first times that I that I realized how our experiences and our lives are erased. Yep. Um, yeah, and then, you know, and then as I got, as I grew up, right, then I kept experiencing like event after event after mm -hmm. event like that. But that was really one of the first times that I was like, oh, so this is the way that the world is made. Right. Um, Blair Kelly has an amazing book too called Black Folks where she talks about domestic servitude and black women. It just came out this summer, it's all the things. I mean, it's a, it's a historical account because she's a historian, but I mean, the way that she describes it and like the narrative that she weaves kind of speaks to that as well. So if I can cite black women, I will. <laughs> Jasmine, I'm such a fan. I'm actually from Colorado and just luckily was in Atlanta tonight and I'm very glad for the experience. I've been so drawn to your work for years now because you understand grief so well and my, my own life has been kind of a metronome of loss. And I wondered, even as you describe grief tonight, you described it as an ocean and I, I have come to think of grief, grief as kind of a formless 
entity. And so I just kind of wonder like how you bring form into loss um, and how you maybe think about like the actual structure of grief. Um, I, always, I, I always return to that metaphor of grief as an, as an ocean. And when I am at my lowest points, it, it feels like I, am, I have lost my vessel mm -hmm. and I am sink, I'm drowning. Um, but that's just what makes sense to me, I think, in like my experience of loss. I mean, I think it's, I think it's useful for each of us who struggle with grief mm -hmm. to try to come up with a metaphor you know, that's why I, I love metaphor. <laughs> Some people don't. Some people uh, hate it. But they ain't Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> but I love metaphor. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I think like, like that was very useful for, for me awesome. to better understand what I was living through. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And what I was trying to survive. To come up with that, that metaphor so I could process it, you know what I'm saying? And, and then, so I can acknowledge that there is a boat. Thank you so much for being here. I uh, love metaphor as well. I teach high school English, and um, I teach Sing Unburied Sing to my ninth graders, and they've connected to it so much, and it's been really wonderful. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I teach Sing Unburied Sing, and I was wondering, uh, you mentioned possible titles that you always kind of keep, and I was wondering if you would share possibly some titles you had in mind as alternates for Sing Unburied Sing that I could share with my students. Thank you. They're on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> a memoir. <laughs> They're on my computer, a memoir. <laughs> because I have whole lists, you know what I'm saying? So it's, I do remember that specifically for Sing Unburied Sing, it was a long list. It was like, it was a single spaced page and it went from the top all the way to the bottom, and then there was another column, you know what I'm saying, of possible um, titles, because I just, I really do struggle with titles, with coming up with good titles. Um, at, uh, but I guess one thing that I can say about the way that I come up with my titles is, as so, um, with Salvage the Bones, I, I mean, I, again, had another list, and for whatever reason, Salvage the Bones worked. Um, and uh, uh, in, one, in a book review about Salvage the Bones, I can't remember which reviewer this was, but they said something like, like they loved the title because it was a command, it's like an active, right, title. And so, Ever since then, I was like, yeah, that is, you know, because I know myself, right? Like, I, I wrote a lot of, you know, short stories when I was studying to get my MFA. Titles were terrible, just terrible, right? Just vague, didn't really have, you know, didn't really give the reader any information about the story or, you know, create any like sparks in the, in, in the reader's imagination about what they were going to encounter. So once I read that, that, like encountered that idea by that reviewer, I was like, okay, all my titles from now on, you know, besides the men we read, I was like, it's gonna, they're gonna be commands, right? I'm gonna be talking to, you know, the reader. And so that's something that I have attempted to do. Even all my, like my lists of the titles that I generate, they're all, they're all commands. Hey Jasmine, I'm a big fan. I drove in from Charleston uh, to hear this tonight. Um, can I ask you a personal question? Maybe. <laughs> um, well, I, I thought we'd like, I think I'm the last one, so I, maybe we can end on like a really positive question. Um, what is your favorite thing about yourself? Wait, wait, what is my what? Your favorite thing about you. You know what, Jason Reynolds actually asked me a question sort of like that in the event that I just did with him in DC like two days ago. Um, so his question was, he was like, if you could say anything to your 10-year-old self, what would you 
say? And I guess that's a question that he's asked. He said he's asked it of like hundreds of writers. Like that's the thing that he'll, he'll ask them, right? And so I'm probably not supposed to say this, but as part of the process, the Oprah process, one, I will say this, just, you have, <laughs> you have to collect materials, right, for the book club, right? And so they, they're asking for, you know, different, the, the, like pictures, right, photographs. And so I had to, you know, I had to go to my mom's house and my mom is like, you know, she's like old school mom in that, you know, she took pictures of us, you know, every step of the way, and she has, I don't know how many, but she told me when I was at her house, but she has like 25 photo albums, right? And, and, and she has the, the year she, she writes, you know, that they're, they're captioned, she knows when it happened, who took it, right? And so I was like looking through the, my mom's photo albums, right? From when I was born, all the way up, you know, to the National Book Awards, right? The, the second uh, National Book Awards well, that my mom actually like attended those with me, right? And I'd never done that before, right? Like I'd never really like sat down and looked at this sort of accounting of my life, right? And in one of those, um, you know, in a lot of those pictures, like I said, for years we live with my grandmama, and you know, and, and so in a lot of those pictures, like it's not just me, it's my grandmama, it's my grandmama's siblings, it's you know, it's they're, it, it, they're at her house, they're in her front yard, they're at my great grandparents' house, right? Um, and that process just made me very aware of where I came from, you know what I'm saying, and who I came from, right? And, and you know, and the fact that, like, nobody in my, in, in my, my mom's, you know what I'm saying, like, my mom and her siblings and stuff, like, nobody was a big reader, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, so there weren't a lot of books. My grandmother had this beautiful Bible, you know, that she kept on this, like, stand in her living room, but, Beyond that, like there weren't a lot of a, a lot of books, um, and you know many of the adults in my in my family, like they were just they were doing the best that they could with the little that they had, right? And they were constantly making a way out of no way, right? And just like I don't know that, like being able to see that and think about. Um, you know, me being this little kid who just fell in love with reading, fell in love with language, and then sometime, you know, when I was in middle school and then into high school, like, realizing that this is something that I wanted to try to do, right? And then at that same time, being called, you know, the N-word in the classroom and having, you know, my peers telling me that the only reason that I was, you know, getting whatever accolades I was receiving and, and getting into the colleges that I got into was because of affirmative action and really I didn't deserve any of, of what was happening for me, right? Um, but yet, you know, that child, right, who came from, you know, domestics and hairdressers and factory workers and bootleggers and you know what I'm saying? Like that kid was like, and who didn't really have a model for becoming a writer, right? And what that might look like was like, okay, well I'm gonna read this book and I'm gonna try to write this poem and then I'm gonna fail at it and then I'm gonna try it again and I'm gonna try it again, and then I'm gonna write some stories, and I'm gonna keep reading, and I'm gonna keep working, um, and I'm gonna dream big, and I'm gonna just believe in this little heart of mine that I can do this. And that little kid stuck with it for decades.
So my stubbornness, my willingness to believe, my imagination, like I love all those things about myself. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for spending your Friday night with us. Thank you, of course, to ER and Karis Books and Karis Circle and Mickey and Deborah and everybody over here at the church that always do such a fantastic job to make us feel so very welcome whenever we are here. Just a reminder, all of the copies of Let Us Descend have already been signed. You can pick those up as you leave. Once again, another round of applause for Jessamyn Ward and Dr. Regina Brown. <laughs>